Hey class, it's Bill here continuing the demo on sorting algorithms. In the earlier earlier video, we took care of looking at the bubble sort and its worst and best case complexity measured by big O or not noted by big O notation. And so we did some work with that and we said we would pick up here with the selection sort. So we're going to do that. Uh, we finished our bubble sort and uh, optimizations and best case, etc. So now let's look at selection sort and look at that algorithm and understand its complexity as well. Now, last time when we looked at the bubble sort, we realized at the end through one of the optimizations that we could consider that there was a sorted and non-sorted portion of the list. Well, it turns out that's pretty important for a lot of sorting algorithms. We want to know what we've already done and what's left to do. So selection sort certainly has this as part of its, uh, its uh, algorithm. Now, what we do with selection sort, the tagline here is the smallest value is swapped to here. Whatever the position is that you're working on, you're swapping the smallest value to here. That's my tagline. So what we do with selection sort is that we first take a position in the list. We're going to start with the left and go one by one in the big outer loop. And for each one, what we're going to do is we're going to look through the array and find the smallest value. So we actually look at every single card. One, two, three, four, five. I look at five cards. I find the smallest one. Right, So I found along the way 2 is smaller. Of course, in the algorithm I'm going, okay, I assume 6 is my smallest. Okay, 3, is that smaller than 6? Yes, so my new smallest is 3. Is 5 smaller than that? Nope. Is 2 smaller than that? Yep, so I have a new smallest that's 2. Is 4 smaller than that? No. So my smallest one is 2. It's at this position. So once you found the smallest card, you swap it with the position that you started looking at, which was position number one, in this case, array position zero. So now we're going to swap these two. So we put the six over here, put the three, the two over here. Now what do we know at this point? Absolutely, we know that the sorted position in our list, the sorted portion, contains just the two. Then we move on to the next position. And we say, okay, let's assume that's the smallest one, three. Is five smaller? No. Is six smaller? No. Is four smaller? No. So we need to swap three, the second position, with the second position. Well, we could be smart enough to say, look, if they're the same, we don't bother swapping them. So we now just know the sorted position or sorted portion grew by one. Then we look at the next position. Okay, assume five is the smallest. Is six smaller? No. Is four smaller? Yes. So our smallest one is four. We swap that then with the five. Okay, then we know the sorted portion grew. Then we look at the next position. We have six. Is it smaller than five? Nope. So we need to swap those. And now we know the sorted position has moved to here. And in fact, we only have to do those four. We don't have to look again because the fifth one is by nature in its, in its place automatically once we finish this exercise. <clears throat> so we really had to do four of those passes. In each one of the passes, we swapped the smallest value in. So we could guarantee the smallest value had, had uh, taken its place and the sorted portion would continue to grow. So that's the selection sort. It's a swapping, you know, one swapping things out. Now, notice sometimes we made really bad swaps. We move the five, uh, we move, you know, we might move the five to the to near the beginning when it needs to be to the end, but we just don't know that, right? The swapping is indiscriminate. So that's how selection sort works. Now, interestingly, with the selection sort, you, uh, the best case is very different. So let's look at this. Okay, we, we start with the a case, the best case where it's already sorted. Now we look at the first position and say, okay, let's assume that's the smallest. Is this smaller? No. Is this smaller? No. Is this smaller? No. Is this smaller? No. Okay, so we have two. We need to swap it with the same position. First position swapped. Okay, we don't need to do that. Now we look at the second one. Assume that's the smallest. Okay, is this smaller? No. Is this smaller? No. Is this smaller? No. We found the smallest one, but it's at the same position, so we don't need to swap. And we continue. You notice we really didn't gain anything. All right, because of the fact that we're consistently, constantly looking for the smallest card on each pass and comparing it with the other cards, we actually haven't done any better in terms of the complexity of the algorithm. So if you walk through that again, we have a very similar worst case than we saw with the bubble uh, that we saw with the bubble sort. So worst case is still big O of n squared. 
right? It's an n squared complexity. But the best case in the selection sort is no better. So even for a sorted list, we have n squared complexity. That's kind of icky. Uh, so we can see that probably a selection sort is not the sort that we would use if we had something that where, uh, let's say, uh, items were added to the end of the list and we just needed to move it into place, where we always know unsorted goes at the end and you needed to move it into place. This is probably not the thing you'd use. You'd either use a bubble sort that came down from the top or you would use another kind of sort like the insertion sort. Okay, so now let's look at the insertion sort, our last of the algorithms. Now with the insertion sort, the tagline here is each is swapped until placed. So we're doing a lot of swapping here, kind of like we did with the bubble sort. And uh, But the other interesting thing here is we assume that we have a sorted portion from the beginning because what we're doing with the insertion sort is always putting a card into where it goes in the already sorted list. Therefore, we always start with one card because we just say, hey, look, hey, that's our starting list right there. Right? We just start with the first one. So this is how it works. We say, okay, this is our sorted portion. Now let's put the three into the sorted portion. Well, okay, compare it with the six. Uh, it's smaller, so we need to swap those two. But now the three is in place in the sorted portion in the list. Therefore, the sorted portion has grown. Now we take the five and we want to put it in place. So we look at how it compares with the sorted values. So five and the six, which is smaller. Well, five is smaller, so we need to swap these two. So we move the five into place. Then we look and see, is it bigger than this one? Yep, it sure is. So it's in place. So now the sorted portion has grown. Take the two, and then we want to put the two in its proper place. So, you know, as humans, we know it goes way down here, but, but the algorithm doesn't know that. It just looks one by one, all right? So six compared to two, okay, well, it needs to be swapped. So move the six over, move the two in place. Five and the two, yep, still needs to be swapped. Move it over, and then here's the five. Two and three, yep, still needs to be swapped. So we move the three, move the f into place, and now we know we have this part of the list is sorted. And then we do the last one. So four, where does it go? Well, it's got to swap with the six, so it goes into place. It's got to swap with the five, so it goes into place here. And now it's in place, and four, nope, still, okay, so we stop because we see that it's not smaller than the three. So now we know, again, that the whole thing is sorted. So with each pass, you're simply taking the next card and you're putting it down where it belongs in the sorted list, the sorted portion. So now let's look at the best case for the insertion sort. We assume this is a sorted portion. We put three into the sorted portion, which requires no swaps. We put four into the sorted portion, which requires no swaps because it's already does the comparison and it's already in place. Five, no swaps. Six, no swaps. So very much like the bubble sort, it only really took one set of comparisons through the whole list, four actually, right? Because we did four comparisons for five cards. And so the best case was pretty slick. So when we look at the big O notation, the complexity for the insertion sort, again we see that the worst case is going to be an N squared complexity. And the best case, as we saw, is really a set of checks through. And that's going to be big O of n, right? That's a linear complexity, whereas the other is basically the you know n squared complexity. So that gives you a good idea of those three algorithms. What I'd like you to do is experiment with those and practice those to where you know exactly how they work. So if in some future exam, hint, hint, you are asked to, to produce this algorithm and I give you a set of starting numbers for an array, you can actually sort them and show what happens after each pass. So please do that and know their big O notations because again, this is just something that you need as a, as a computer science student. <clears throat> you should know these things, right? They're just, it's a common term to know. The, there are lots of good materials that you can find in the world. One of them is a fun one that's color-coded. It's the Big O Cheat Sheet, and it's got uh, array sorting algorithms as part of the deal, and you can see that bubble sort, insertion sort, selection sort are there, best, average, and worst. And it also talks about space complexity, which is a piece we didn't talk about, because 
these sorting algorithms don't use extra space, right? They just need one extra temporary value to do the swapping, but they don't need another array. They don't need more values. It's it's pretty. It's actually pretty darn uh, compact in terms of the space. Now there's a lot of swapping, right? So that's that's expensive in one way, but it doesn't take up more space. Now this is a favorite trick in an interview, is that once you give a basic answer to a question, they will constrain you in some way. So it may not happen with sorting algorithms, but with some other work that you do, they may say, okay, now can you do that without using another array? Or now can you use that without going through the, the, the uh, complexity, you know, with a, with a smaller complexity? So these are favorite things in interviews, and they're things that you should understand, the, you know, the notation and the discussion, and the fact that there are algorithms that are better for space or better for complexity, etc. So here are a few other reference materials. If you want to look them up, the bubble sort optimizations that we discussed are there, and uh, the bubble sort is given in various languages. You've also got some practice on our site where it can generate some numbers for you, and then it will show you what happens in each pass. Again, I think it's better to work with the physical cards, but you know, do what you want. There's also a video on big O notation that's kind of decent that's linked here. There's some animations which actually show you how the things progress so you can see the different algorithms, many different algorithms in action. And then the uh, algorithm complexity cheat sheet that I just showed you the, uh, the little piece of is also linked here. So lots of good stuff here about algorithms. Uh, these are things that you will be working on from now till forever, right? Your algorithms are at the heart of what you do. And it's really great for you to be able to think these through and then code them up. So the two big things with algorithms, understand them deeply and then be able to translate them into code. If you do that, you're going to be golden and you're going to have a lot more success uh, than you would otherwise in the world of computer science and interviewing for programming jobs. So thanks for watching and that brings us to the end of our sorting algorithms video set. Thanks.